This is the Ross Developers Podcast, episode 92. Hello, ROS developers, and welcome to the ROS Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that gives you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with ROS. This is Ricardo from The Construct, and today I would like to dedicate uh, this episode to all those ROS engineers around there that are thinking about building the next robots that will go to Mars. So if you are thinking about that, you are thinking about the possibilities, how to do it, how to use ROS in those robots, of course, then this episode is dedicated to you. Um, today, we are going to work uh, to talk with uh, one person who has been working on ROS for robots in space. But before going into that, let me remind you about our Robot Ignite Academy, the academy that we have online for teaching and learning ROS. So in our academy, we have a specific courses that uses simulations in the cloud to teach you how to program robots with ROS, starting from the basics and going into very advanced topics. So you can go there and learn ROS very fast by using the simulations and practicing on the simulations. And you know what? We have recently added a real robot lab that you can access remotely. So not only practice on the simulations, but also on the real robots. Try it. I will put it a link on the show notes here, and you will see that you are going to have a very good learning experience. And learning ROS is going to be something very different. You will see. Okay, so that's all for the commercials, and let's go for the for the meat of the episode, the important stuff. And uh, here today we have uh, Alison Thaxton, who is the tech, at present is the tech leader manager at Guaymo, but she was a former software engineer at NASA, where she was working developing uh, ROS-based robots that were actually sent to space. So welcome to the podcast, Alison. Hello, yeah, nice to be here. Our pleasure, our pleasure. We have been planning this interview for many, many weeks and finally we, we achieve it. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be here. I like what everything is that the contract has been doing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I knew about you, about your presentation at the Roscon in 2014. And that's why I, I find it very interesting what you were presenting there. And I think that you have a lot to say here because uh, recently the NASA has decided to use ROS in, in robots that they are going to send to the moon in rovers. And then, uh, so you, you, I think that you are one of the person that has more experience on this subject in really sending ROS robots to, to, to the space. So I would like uh, to, to ask you some questions. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, let's go for that. Then, uh, so one of the, the first question is, um, what was your first uh, project where you use ROS with a robot that was going to be sent to a space? Yeah, so I guess the first project that I worked on uh, when I started um, working in the Robonauts lab uh, was an inverse kinematic solver for the robot. And so uh, I guess it tied into my thesis, uh, which um, had to do with uh, task-based decomposition of uh, inverse kinematics uh, and doing a manipulation, um, guided manipulation on a, a semi-autonomous vehicle for uh, uh, underwater intervention mission. So I like had a big, there was a big submarine and it had an arm attached to it. And so um, I wrote a lot of the like manipulation software for that platform. And so when I started at uh, at NASA, like they obviously like Cartesian control is also something that's important for all robots and especially for manipulators. And so uh, one of the first tasks that I did was kind of translate some of my, my thesis work into, um, into the robot. Directly into the yeah. robonaut. 
into Robonaut, yeah. Okay, so when you started to work at NASA, then Robonaut was already built. Yeah, when I started working at NASA, Robonaut was already built. Uh, it was actually already launched on the space station as oh, well. Okay. So, so the torso was on the space station. Um, it had a stanchion that would connect it to, to the, the station so they could do um, some uh, experiments with it, manipulation experiments in space. Um, when I started, they were trying starting to upgrade the robot. Um, they wanted to uh, add a pair of what we called climbing legs to the robot uh -huh. uh, and also upgrade the processors and some of the sensors uh, in order to make it a little bit more modernized. Um, and so I came in during that upgrade process. And so uh -huh. that's actually when Ross was selected as being one of the technologies that would go on the robot. Um, previous to that, they like Ross was you know, too immature. It wasn't, it wasn't around uh -huh. when it first launched. Uh, Robonet first launched in like 2011, which I think was a little bit um, in the, the early, the very, either the very early stages of before. Uh, yeah, was, was of Ross. Of Ross. Okay. Okay. Then if I have understood correctly, then the first time that Robonet was launched to the space, then it was not running Ross. That's right. Okay. Then at some point in time, it was upgrade to Ross? Yeah, so what we did uh, is that we um, we wanted to add mobility to the robot. And so okay. we wanted to do this so that we wouldn't have to take so much um, astronaut time in order to mm -hmm. like run our experiments. Because up until that point, like we had to uh, basically schedule astronaut time and, uh, and um, data link time in order to like do any experiments, right? So we had to have the astronaut take the robot out of out of its storage container. We had to have them, you know, connect it to the the station and set everything up. And then we had to have them like man the e stop or the 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 motion stop um, as as we were doing an experiment. And so mm -hmm. as you can imagine, that's like very you know kind of in yeah that that takes a lot of time and it's not really high value work for the astronaut to do. Um, there are a lot of other experiments that happen on the space station. A lot of them need much more, um, a, you know, scientific backgrounds and research and and things that the astronauts productive. Are yeah, That's more it. productive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then then our our experiment, um, which you know, manipulation in space, I think has a, a really, um, you know, has 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 you know value for 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 NASA, but maybe not for like the astronaut to just like basically yeah. use it, this robot. <laughs> yes. um, and so the idea was we add a pair of mobility legs to it. And these these legs were kind of like um, were, were grappling legs. So they were designed to grapple the handrails on the space station. Like yeah. it could dock and undock itself and go do its experiment and then dock itself back in. And so one of the key po points of this is that we wanted to do all of this without having to have an astronaut sit there and basically babysit the robot. And so part of it was being able to like safety certify that the robot was going to be safe around humans. And so we had a two factor safety certification uh, system that, that was a part of the, like the software development that I was there working on. And that's the thing that I presented at uh, Roscon. Um, so, so it was like a lot of that work was, you know, being able to upgrade the robot to make it like more convenient. And so mm -hmm. we could do more experiments and not have to like, take so much of, of astronaut time. Okay, De okay, then it was in, within this upgrade that Robonaut was going to be running with Ross. So up to that point, it was not running at all. Uh, well, it was running. It was. It had a different software suite on it. So no, we no, were able Ross. To do Sorry, yeah, I mean Ross. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up until that point, it didn't have any any Ross on it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Then I, I I'm mistaken because I thought that. It was running Ross from the almost from the very beginning that was sent there, uh, but it wasn't during that time because it, it, I suppose that it was easier to to manage everything if you upgrade to Ross and then you add the legs. It's, yeah, I, I guess it, so. It was so it was <laughs> Sorry, so. But part of I, the upgrade to the legs was actually that we got to send new processors as well. Uh -huh. So we actually had like the computers that that we were going to launch and we could like load the new software on it. And so that's uh -huh. what made it easier to like do the do it all together. Right. So we we had new new computers. We had three different computers for 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 the two factor safety certification. So we had one that was doing that was like the one that was commanding the robot, one that was doing a, the, a similar like 
command and then one that was like double checking that both matched, right? And so this is like one of the ways we had like two-factor safety certification, but all of that had to go up together in order for us to certify that it could run on the station without an e-stop. And yeah, that did take extra, you know, we had extra equipment, we had new legs and like all of that kind of was like one package that got sent uh, together. Okay. And how did you test all this on earth? Because I have seen the legs that uh, they look like uh, for the people who hasn't seen it, I will put a link to the to some pictures on, on the show notes, but it, it, they look like an octopus legs, <laughs> kind of. So it's different. So it's difficult to to think how to test because on a humanoid robot, at least you you know. So you put the, the legs straight, and then it becomes. But here in in Earth, how did you test it? Uh, so at the at at Johnson Station, there's a artificial gra there's a gravity offload testing uh, facility. So you can connect the robot to uh, this device that will like offload the force of gravity. It is a and it's similar to like what the astronauts will use to or it is the same thing that the astronauts will use to train for like how zero g environments work. Uh, it is a little bit different though in that like as you as you reach out your arm or your legs or whatever. Uh, obviously, there's still the force of gravity here, um, but all of the weight is is like removed from the the things that um, can can be reacted. So anything that it's it's grappled to and the and its torso can can sort of like mimic zero g. But as you're like reaching your hand out, right? There's no nothing no force that you can like offload because it's just like there. And so it is a very like hybrid kind of test facility uh, for okay. for us. And we had to like develop the software in order to like go into this like hybrid mode for testing. Um, but yeah, so we, we were able to test some things in space. We were also able to do things uh, with simulation as well. Um, you probably saw like the space robotics challenge uh, yes. was, was one, one of the ideas that, that came out of that. And by using ROS, we were able to like leverage a lot of the tools that um, that is available within the community. So like Gazebo, Arviz, uh, yes. you know, RQT, Robot Monitor, like the ROS logs, all of that stuff um, became available to us and we didn't have to, you know, like make, make our own for those things. Um, and so that was also really like a, a performance boost for, for us. Great, great. Uh, so <laughs> I, I cannot imagine how this hybrid hybrid uh, system for gravity, anti-gravity or compensating gravity system. I, I don't know. I, in my in my mind, I, I cannot imagine the. So, did you try yourself to, to go in the? In, <laughs> in the <laughs> I was unfortunately unable to, to go in in the the, the gravity all thing, but I did work on robots that were okay. working. Okay. So okay. I, I got to okay. I got to play with the robot in the in the yeah. facility. I, I didn't personally get to be able to get uh, hooked up into it. Um, it, okay. it did look fun. Um, I think okay. if you. Uh, uh, there is actually like a, a One Direction a music video where they. Um, went to, uh, they went to the NASA Space Center and they got to be ah, in the-, the Ah, facility, okay. So. Oh, so you mean the One Direction is, a, um, is a, the song, the singer's uh, band? Yeah, 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 the band. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the band. band, okay, okay. Yeah. The band. okay, 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 great. I uh, will put a link on the show notes <laughs> for that too. And Robonaut's in that music video as well. So. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. okay, then, yeah. then it's a must, <laughs> then it's a must, yes. Okay, okay, you, you convinced me, great. And, yeah, let me see my this. Oh, yeah, one of the questions is not related to Ross, but is by curiosity. It's about sending that robot into the space station. So I know that how expensive it is to send something this into the space station. So not allowed, not allowed to send your mouse. You have to send. So, but a robot is so expensive. So how how was it? possible that you send this, uh, how, how it is managed that they allow you to send the, the robot to the space station? Yeah, I guess I can talk a little bit about the history of how Robonaut, uh, at least the Robonaut 2 was developed. Uh, so uh, the lab at NASA, you know, was looking at um, manipulation and specifically like manipulation around people. Um, mm -hmm. And so G GM also had a similar need for manipulation around um, uh, their workers and factories, right? So they approached uh, they, you know, they they approached NASA, and there was like good synergy there. And so there was a partnership to develop Robonaut two uh, between the two uh, groups as like here's a robot that can work alongside humans, not within like a cage that you would normally find in a manufacturing plant. 
um, but actually alongside humans doing real work. And so the, it, we, a partnership was developed and Robonaut sort of came out of that. Um, during the development of that, I think they saw how, like, how well it was working. And so it was one of those things where it was kind of, the story I've always heard is kind of like, because the, the, they saw how well it was working and they were impressed by the technology that you know, we were able to put together with Robonaut. And then it was, the decision was made that like on the, one of the last uh, space shuttle missions that they would, they, they actually wanted to launch it. Um, I think one of the, one of the reasons is one, it provided them a, a research, a, a research platform for manipulation in space. Uh, it's very hard to test manipulation in, in, in space on the ground because we are like surrounded by gravity all the time. And a lot of like the manipulation things that you might do um, as a roboticist to like pick up a cup or whatever, actually rely a lot on the gravity being there. So you can imagine like the, the most, the, the most common way that you pick up things with like a hand or gripper based manipulator is like a push grasp. So basically like you push the item across the table just a little bit, it kind of gets wedged into like yeah. where it should be grasped and then you, you, you close your hand, right? That doesn't work in space. So if you try to do that in space, as soon as you touch it, it flies away. Uh -huh. like, it uh -huh. doesn't like gather into the right like spot in your hand. And so like being able to do good experiments with like manipulation in space um, was, is actually like a really great thing to do. And, you know, like simulation at the time was not like, especially manipulation based simulation where you had like a lot of context, it's very difficult for simulators to do appropriately. So still like the, today still today right yeah so it's one of it was like the easiest way to test if whether or not manipulation your manipulation algorithms will work is kind of to do it in the area that you're going to with the with the setup that you're going to have and so like putting it on the space station um was one of the was one of those points i think um, one of the things that they one of the goals that the program had was to be able to do dexterous manipulation uh, better than a human can do it in an in a space suit and so it's not 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 like as dexterous as you know you and me just like puttering around the house or whatever but like you know wearing these thick gloves that the rope that the astronauts have to deal with like we think that we can actually do that better um with a robot that doesn't uh -huh. that that it, that's its native state right uh, and so part of that was like trying to, to drive that technology forward to be better than an astronaut would be in a spacesuit because one of the most dangerous things that an astronaut does or is asked to do is to do, you know, EVAs to go outside of the space station. Ah, okay. And so if you could have a robot do most of that work for you, then you wouldn't have to put yourself in that kind of harm's way. Uh -huh. Yes, I have seen some, um, some uh, videos that are uh, uh, 3D representations of the robot out with the legs moving outside of the of the space station moving uh, with those legs that you uh, that you prepare for for that upgrade and um then okay. yeah sure go ahead. Go yeah ahead. I, was say, I guess the interesting is that because it was developed with uh, gm the, the first the 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 torso was developed as a partnership with gm and it was designed to be kind of like on a, the manufacturing floor it was not designed to be outside of the space station so I think it's like convection cooled things that like would not work in, in uh, outer okay. space and things like that. Okay. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think that the idea was that you do manipulation tasks inside the space station where it's like, uh, you know, if you drop something or whatever, like you can, like the astronauts can help, like, you know, gather things that you might do. Whereas like, if you were, if you were to just go straight to outer space and you like, uh, you know, like you, you dropped a, you know, a hammer or like a drill or whatever, then like, then that's a debris that could potentially hurt the space station. So we wanted to make sure that manipulate, like we had the manipulation down in space before we like sent it outside. Uh huh. Okay. 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 I, I understand. Okay. Then, uh, then um, another question here I have is, um, so the, the plan, the plan was to send those, uh, extra legs to the robot and make this upgrade. And then uh, finally, what happened with that? So did finally uh, the robot was upgraded? Is it is still the robot running in, in the space station? What happened? Yeah, so the, the upgrade, it was like a very invasive ro robot surgery, right? So we had the torso it was on a stand we're, we're connecting legs to it that were like never like that it was designed to, to be a torso in the beginning right like it was mm. never really originally designed to 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 have legs 
and we added new processors. And so it was like this really big, like kind of like just assemble a robot in space kind of task. Yes. Um, <laughs> my God, my God. Uh, and so, you know, the assembly, you know, in astronaut, we had all, all the instructions, you know, you like label out like everything that you're supposed to do. And the astronaut did a great job putting everything together. Um, and we, we got to like, so, so the astronaut put everything together. There, there are pictures of the robot in with the legs in the space station. Um, but then we went to like do all of our checkouts of like, let's turn it on. Let's see, you know, if it, you know, survived launch. Cause like when you're upgrading it, like you, there's, you don't know whether or not like it really survived launch. You have to like connect everything and, you know, power it on and do all of that stuff before yes. you can actually do any of the checkouts. Uh, so we, we started doing all of our checkouts and then the, the computers would like shut down and we would be like, what, what happens? We, I got to, we got to turn it on. I got to see all of my sensor data. I was the lead of perception at the time. So like I, I wrote a lot of the, the drive, the Ross drivers that were wow. on up there. And I was like, Oh, like my drivers work. The sensors are yeah. turning on, like everything's great. And then like the ro the, the computers would shut down. Uh, and so I think that continued during the, the checkouts and we kept trying to figure out like, what is the problem? Like, you know, what, what went wrong? Like what, like, is there a loose wire somewhere or whatever? Um, and I think at the end of the, the checkout period, um, I think they, they kept trying to like diagnose things and send like more, more like, why don't you, you know, ask the astronauts to, but you have to schedule astronaut time to do. Yeah, I, know, too, right? I know. Um, to like look at things like, oh, maybe if we had this information from the sensor or whatever, maybe we can figure out what's wrong and like try to repair it in space. Um, but I think we ended up, they ended up uh, sending it back down to earth to do a more formal like diagnostic of like uh -huh. what, what went wrong with the upgrade. Um, and I think they found like it was a, 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 a like a wiring issue that, that was preventing, that was preventing the robot from turning on. So we got, um, it got to turn on. I got to see my data. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, because so the Ross did fly in space uh, <laughs> and, and it did turn on and we did collect some data with it. Uh, but awesome. we, we were unfortunately hey, we, weren't able to do any of that. Can, can we get this data? Do you have a back, a Ross back by any chance of that? Well, I, I mean, like, I think NASA has those Ross ah, okay. that you have to release. Okay. Then release that's I don't personally have on those <laughs> A secret <laughs> things and they, they don't share anything damn it okay but anyway so the situation was that you were in on earth and and you were connected to the robot uh, there and then the the astronauts were the ones that were doing the procedure for upgrading the robot so you didn't yep. send anybody else to do that it has to be them Yes. Right? Ah, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Just to understand okay because I don't know those uh, those procedures and I think that it could be interesting for the audience also to understand. Okay, so you were seated there and seen following the procedure in real time, and then can at some point in time connecting to the topics. Is it to the topics or? Yeah, yeah. So when we turned it on, that was like one of the ways that we would we check out the robot, right? Uh, it was like connect to the Ross topics, and like wow. I said, like when I said like see the data, like I mean, like we were like streaming the like like RQT plug RQT, for, yeah, exactly. wow. <laughs> seeing, the, awesome. seeing the, the, the data come down. So yeah, and we had like, uh, you know, the the robot monitor or whatever for, to like, to make, you know, to see what the status of, was of all the joints and all of the sensors and everything was. Uh, so yeah, we we were, it did turn on. We did see all of the things, uh, the data. Uh, but, oh, I'm so jealous. Uh, so <laughs> it has to be, it has, has to be so awesome experience that and, and so proud you you of your work so uh, amazing amazing and uh, then uh, so the, the due to this problem there was no more time dedicated to that right because it, there is kind of a, a schedule or a package of time for each uh, experiment in in the space station is that right so they couldn't dedicate more time to try to figure out what is the uh, the problem uh, they, they did dedicate a, more time to try to figure out what the problem was, but I think it was one of those things that was just really hard to diagnose yeah. and di diagnose in space. Um, and so they ended up wanting to send it back down to, yeah. to like do a more thorough um, like retrospective on it. Um, damn it. Yes. So, <laughs> so sad that part, that last part, but I know th this because that's what happened with so complex robots. So it's normal when you are building, <laughs> even if you have built five before, then the sixth one, you can have this problem 
and then you have to dedicate the time. You have to dedicate that. So it happened to me on my previous work and many, many times. And, and so I understand, but in, in those cases, we had the time. So, because we had to deliver at the, until the end, until <laughs> it's finished. So if not today, then tomorrow, then tomorrow, then tomorrow, until you finish and you, you at the end, we solve, of course. Yeah, but in, yeah. that, in that case was limited. So. Yeah, we have limited time with the with the astronaut, and also, you know, the, like the, the equipment that the astronauts have on the ISS is only what you, we've sent up yeah. there, right? And so, like, it, it obviously didn't have like all of the equipment that you would have in a robotics lab, um, and so it was just, you know, a, a little, it's definitely more difficult to uh, debug a robot and and understand why it's not working in space when you're like going through, you basically like play a game of telephone to tell the astronaut what to yeah. what they need to do <laughs> next or whatever. Um, especially if it's like off procedure or like you need to adjust the procedure like real time um, as you're like seeing the, 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 you know, the video of like what's happening or like the data that's coming back or whatever. And so it's, it definitely is like a much longer process to try to like do that uh, through, through it, like in the space station um, yes, through, space. through all of those channels than it, than it is to just like bring it down and be like, oh, you know, like I can take this apart. I know like I have all of the, my equipment to like diagnose what, what is possibly going wrong and and the like subject matter expert expert that can basically like do that iteration like hands-on um, yeah there's it's a shame that they didn't allow the the astronaut to bring his own mouse and maybe <laughs> that would have solved some problems just joking just joking then um the one question is uh, why did you decide to use ross and rubonaut yeah, so I think Ross was uh, was like a new, I guess, a newcomer into the field when we started. So when we started, it was on Ross Fuerte, um, which is pretty um, early on in the in, in Ross's development. But like it, it would already, it had already like spread across all of the the universities, uh, and and NASA does have like strong partnerships with like researchers and mm -hmm. and and um, and universities. And it was seen as a way to uh, like democratize uh, some of like manipulation in space. And so like if you had ROS as, as one of the interfaces you could use with the robot, then like a lot of university, um, you, you know, research that was coming out of universities could be applied to it. And also that we could do things like the Space Robotics Challenge or whatever. And like one of the awards could have possibly been that like you get to actually run your code on in space, right? As like you were the best, you know, you, you, you you won if you won the competition maybe you'd be able to like actually get your code running on on a robot in space which is uh, pretty exciting. Yes. Um, okay okay, and uh, then uh, you you mentioned that you were using in your presentation of Roscon 2014. I will put a link also on the show notes. You mentioned that you were combining in the Robonaut Ross with Orocos. So what was it used for? Orocos. Yeah, Orocos. Uh, we used Orocos to do all of the um, core uh, software that was on the robot. So uh, ROS isn't really like real time safe. Uh, you know, there there are, are are issues with like comms and stuff with that that we couldn't really rely on it for like the safety system. And so we used Orocos's like real time toolkit in order to get like real time. Uh, real-time response from the robot and um, also so we could do like shared memory transport and stuff like that so that we we could um, more like lock down what the what the the code is like the safety code that was like running on the robot and so that was one of the reasons we used uh, Orocos was that it had bindings to ROS so we could we could tell uh, you know you could tell Orocos like here are some here are some topics that are like you know broadcast only so you could be like okay uh, all the joint states or whatever, you know, are broadcast only and that that in the Rokos could handle like the the, the, the more of like bossy like um, uh, transport of, of or, or like uh, connection to to ROS that way, but like keep its like internal like modules um, in, in real time, right? Uh -huh. um, so Rokos was like the core of the system and most of the work that I did was was actually kind of in Orocos, like so the 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 Cartesian solver was in it was used Orocos as as its platform, um, and like so did all like the joint state controllers and things like that. Um, we're, we're all using uh, Orocos as like the the SDK basically that okay. we were using for that. Um, but we were we were able to like open up certain like topics for command, and so we had like a 
a task commander, which was like a piece of software that we had written to like um, to do what we would call like application layer um, control. So that's like the things that you would um, like the higher level control stuff. Uh, and that all spoke ROS. And so it would basically speak ROS to the robot. The robot would then like translate everything into, you know, like real Cartesian commands or an actuator commands um, within like the Oroco stack. Oroco, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so like things like we, like I was able to hook the robot up to use things like move it. So like move it was one of the things that like we would use with, with the robot. Um, and, uh, you know, we had some, some custom things as well, but yeah. It, it was the, in that layer, that higher level um, control, like the higher level layer was the thing that we would, we were expecting other people to want to um, like contribute to. Because that's actually how you like made, um, you like did your task and motion planning problem was like all in the, the ROS layer. Uh-huh, okay, yeah. So, but at the end, the Orocos is the one that is controlling the real time uh, control. So doing the real time controls that, the times they are met and the joints are the proper locations in, at the proper time. So, so the, the, the big task, the big level task, which is to grasp something that can be sent as a command, grasp this, then it's the actual small tasks that are the commands to the joints, they are handled in real time by Orocos, not by mm -hmm. Ross. Yeah, so like all the trajectory following uh, code was all done uh, in with, inside of Rokos, yeah. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, that's very typical. Uh, now it's very typical setup. I don't know now if we, with ROS2, if things are going to start to change because it's, it's well, but ROS2 also uses Orocos at some point <laughs> in order to have uh, real time, as far as I know, as far as I know. Not an expert yet in, in ROS2. But in ROS1, many robots, the humanoids that uh, on the previous company I was working, then we were building human-sized humanoid robots. And then we use this, also this setup. Orocos was as a real time controlling the, the walking of the guy. But you can see the publishing of the topics. Uh, so the publishing of the joints in to, into topics. And you can take this information also for other things. But they, those publications were not real time. So there could be some inconsistencies at some point in time, but for a task level, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. That's good yeah, enough. Yeah, you, you get to take advantage of like all the tooling that was like yeah. in RAW. So like you get to use Arvis and like- Exactly. Uh, like, and it and actually made it easier to put things into like gazebo because then you could test, test your task level code um, using simulation. Uh, and you know, the, you know, assume that like the the lower the lower end system was the was you know like being uh, simulated by by the simulator, but like all the task level code would be the same for both the simulator and the robot. Mm -hmm. yeah, correct, exactly, exactly. Okay, great. Then another question. Um, in your presentation, you were talking about a problem of radiation for robots in a space. So what is that? And how did you solve uh, in Rubonaut? Yeah, so radiation um, is obviously one of the problems you, you have in space. Uh, what it ends up doing is like, it, 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 um, what it ends up looking like is like random bit flips in your code, right? So what would happen if you like randomly injected, uh, you know, a, a bit flip somewhere? Uh, and so, the part of the, the like safety certain this is why it was like two factor safety certified is that like random bit flips are probably not going to be consistent among like multiple computers right uh -huh. and so like this is why we had three different computers that were all kind of like double checking each other um so we had two um things that were doing into two computers that were had identical software but were doing independent reads of, from of the joint states uh and then we had a third computer that was like double checking that the those two values were like about the same right uh, and so like, that was like one of the ways that we like dealt with radiation space. Uh, also the fun fact like ECC and RAM is also pretty good at, at um, dealing with bit flips. It turns out if you get transistor, transistors small enough, uh, you see similar problems of random bit flipping. Mm -hmm. And so like the normal ECC RAM that you have in your computer is actually um, pretty good at being able to deal with uh, uh, radiation style bit oh. flips. Okay. And so this is why I like CubeSats and stuff that are like really cheap, uh, you know, small little satellites that people have been launching. That's this is why that they actually work so well uh, without having to get all of like the certification ah. testing is because ECC RAM is like one of those things that like 
just happens to also do this really well. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have no idea about that. Okay. It's <laughs> awesome. It's, it's great. And then, yeah. Okay. And then what happens if you get, uh, if this third computer detects that there is a, a pro one data that doesn't, one bit that doesn't match between the two yeah, computers. Yeah. So, so, so if there happens? are any, yeah, if there are any inconsistencies between the two computers, we would basically uh, put it into like motion stop. And so like we would arrest uh -huh. all motion uh, and, and let it, you know, we, we would basically that, that event would be sent down to us as engineers on, on the ground. And we would can, you know, could look through the logs and see like what happened or if it was just a random bit, bit, bit flip or whatever. Uh, and then like restart, like re-clear, clear that the error okay. and like just start over again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it basically was, was, wow. was, would trigger a motion stop of the robot. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. I don't understand how this could work. So, so many problems, so complicated <laughs> and, and it's still the, the space station is there and the robot was there doing, I, I mean, it, it it was not able to to move with the legs, but it was doing a lot of other things. So awesome, awesome. <laughs> okay, then um, what about the safety of uh, preventing the robot from colliding and harming so somebody? So how did you manage that? Yeah, so we had like so we had a whole like safety certification that we had to go through, and so a lot of the things that. Uh, uh, we, we would measure we would measure things like the the force that we were imparting on the world we had like force torque sensors on on all of the limbs uh we we could also like measure that that force using uh the torque from the joints we could add we could we could add all of that up and like determine what the the resulting force was on that we were importing on the world and so like we had limits of how much force we were allowed to like exert right uh -huh. uh, and we also had, we would also measure things like the momentum that the robot was creating. And so like, it is a really big robot. I don't know if, if people could like have, have a sense of how big this robot was. It's like, if you were to, um, you know, look at it on earth, it's like that it has like a seven foot long wingspan. It was like with the legs, it was like eight feet tall. Uh, and so it was, it was like a really big, <laughs> it's kind of a big robot, but it was, it was within like the realm of of human, right? Like it was like Shaquille O'Neal could could was like about the right size for, for this robot. Okay. Um, uh, and so we we would measure we would measure things like what is the momentum momentum that we were we were creating with the robot. So you can imagine as it's like climbing around the space station, like it's moving its whole body to mm -hmm. do this. And so there was like a maximum speed that we were we could do the body, but we didn't want to like limit the entire robot to that speed because that would be very slow. If you imagine like all of this mass moving versus just like your fingers or your, your hands moving around. We wanted uh -huh. to make sure that like the that we could actually do like quicker manipulation with mm -hmm. the with the hands uh and and you know with the extremities than we would allow ourselves with the with the torso. And so we like we we tested we we formulated that into momentum, and we had like momentum limits that we were that we gave ourselves, um, and then we had like uh, pinch detections for the the grippers uh, as because like I said they grappled the handrails, so basically they were designed to mate with the handrails of the space station, and so we wanted to make sure that like you know if an astronaut's hand was there or something that like they wouldn't get pinched. Um, uh -huh. So software. all this software was dedicated just to check for those safety measures. So if any of those constraints was uh, uh, was rich, then the robot would stop or something like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you you added also all these extra sensors just for this purpose about two, uh, or maybe the, the, just you, for that purpose. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're the robot. It's like right. you know, why why can you feel things and feel forces and things? Because they they help with manipulation. They yeah, yeah, you, that's you know, right. They climb around, and so they were kind of dual purpose for for the sensors, right? Like we definitely use them in in our algorithms for like how do you graph the handrail? Uh -huh. Force was a part of that. The cameras were a part of that. Um, and, and so yeah, they were used for multiple reasons. I don't think we had anything on there that was like. Yeah, at least those those were not just for safety. Okay, <laughs> maybe the patch, GM. Do you know the patch? Yeah, the, GM. The patch. Maybe yeah. that that one was just for for commercial purposes. <laughs> uh, well, like I said, it was developed as a partnership with GM, and so yes, they yes, like significant resources into helping us uh, develop that robot. So yeah, I think they deserve oh. their patch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They deserve. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. 
<laughs> okay, the, uh, let's see. Um, um, the next question is, um, at any point in time, was the robot uh, being uh, um, running autonomously or it was for the whole life of the robot? Uh, when it was doing something, then it was kind of, uh, of uh, remotely controlled. Yeah, I would say it was semi semi autonomous. So we would have semi. tasks that okay. we would do, like we would be like a go grab that thing or whatever. But so like one of the the things that we worked on was like trying to understand how to manipulate opening and closing a zipper. Um, another thing we we tried to do or that we did was um, uh, you know like me measure airflow velocity. Um, we had some experiments on uh, how do you um, like scan, like use an RFID reader to like scan the contents of a bag. These are all things that the that the astronauts would like be ha tasked to do, and that we thought that the robot could actually like offload from them, because like doing inventory and things isn't isn't also not a high value thing for an astronaut to do. It'd be easier for the robot if like something else could just like be inventory for them, right? Uh, or like testing the airflow of the of the of the ISS, which is important for their health, but like is also kind of like you just like stick a sensor up there for a little while and you have to hold still and then like you read the, the reading right. So it's like not high value things for an astronaut to do, but it, they are things that a robot could do for them. Uh, so we did a whole bunch of uh, experiments um, around that. And 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 this, this those decisions to perform those tests, like measuring the the airflow. For example, that was decided from the ground, or it was decided inside the station. I mean, is an astronaut that says to the robot out, "Hey, do this, please." Or yeah, that was from the ground. So we would have a like we would have a command station. We would have a data link to to the robot, and then we could like start the task, and then we could monitor how well it was how well it was working, and like uh -huh. if it like things if things weren't working quite as we expected because it's manipulation in space and there's no there wasn't really a great way of doing that on the ground then like we could pause and like re you know um like retune parameters or whatever and then have it go again so okay. there there was a there was um some interaction with the the ground control but it wasn't in it wasn't uh like fully teleoperated so there wasn't like a person with like a joystick or whatever that was yeah, doing, yeah like, okay very, like fine grain commanding of it um, it was more a high level than that. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm sorry for asking you those very basic questions, but, but uh, from my point of view of ignorance about how these things work in space, so that I'm very interested on in knowing the actual details about how you do this, these things, even if it's nothing related to ROS, but uh, in, in order to, to understand how they work and how they are going to work in the close future. Because yeah. I think it is a little bit different from like the other robots that are on the space station. So like you've probably seen like the Canada arm uh, for, for things, the, the, the larger manipulator that's on the, the space station. And they do like more, they, they do like joystick or, you know, yeah. more directly teleoperate. Um, and that. also for, by the astronauts th themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh, then in this case for the robot is more, is closer to what is happening, for example, with the rover that is now in Mars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you give it you give it a higher level task, and then you send it all in its way, and you you like monitor how it's going. Of course, with Mars, there's like a large time delay, so it's delay. Like, okay. <laughs> the monitoring thing is a little less real time. But yeah, uh, okay, it's similar to that. It's a more high level control, but it's not it's not like the robots like you know Rosie the robot type of thing where you just like say you know clean the station or whatever, <laughs> and then it just like goes and does this thing. Uh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not yet. Not yet. We are working on that. We are working. Great. And uh, another question. Um, so, okay, you mentioned about the kind of experiments that you were doing about measuring things and, and, and grasping, trying to grasp. And um, uh, also you mentioned about what happened at the end by the legs. So they, they were uh, brought back to, to Earth. And uh, then... Um, can you tell us something about the simulation? And so you, you have mentioned already that you created a simulation of uh, the Rubonaut and also even some, pa some parts of the space station. And I have seen this panel thing that the robot is trying to flip some switches and so on. So what can you tell us if this was ac an actual experiment that was going to be performing uh, on the space station or 
what was the purpose of this simulation? Uh, yeah, so that panel actually was flown up with Robonaut. So the panel in the sim is a replica, is a simulated replica of, of a, a panel that was on the space station. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so the the point of that panel was for us to do manipulation experiments in space. And so there's like a whole bunch of different kinds of buttons that like we have on the space station. There are different kinds of letter, levers, uh, uh, different uh, you know interfaces that the astronauts will use. Uh, and so yeah, that the we have we also have a simulated model of it. I guess an interesting thing about that is that the uh, we actually crowdsourced some of the some of the like development of that particular model. We had um, uh, we had a, like a a crowd a, a crowd like source initiative to like uh, develop some of these models for the space station. So we had one that was developing. Um, that we we sent out pictures of like items that the that we have on the space station and like uh, people there was a competition and people could like make wow. uh, like make replicas of those models and like we picked the best one and you know they got and they were rewarded for that. Um, there was a similar one for the the task panel where it was like okay well we need to have a controller and and Ross to to like be able to like understand when like switches are activated and like, mm -hmm. you know, like make the task panel like light up differently when like buttons are certain buttons are pressed or whatever. And so that was also a, a little competition that was was um, spun up in order to like develop more of our, our simulation capabilities. And all of that was in support of trying to um, like understand how we can better leverage simulation in space and um, and then later on that that developed into like the space robotics challenge where um, we partnered with OSRF to to have this um, challenge to like like I said like more democratize like manipulation and, and space robotics and so it's like here's a simulation of of our robot you know we'll give, we'll give you a set of tasks for it to do and then if you you do well in this competition um, you'll get you'll get a reward. Okay. Um... You are explaining so many things and many questions pop into my mind. <laughs> Let me select just one because otherwise we are going to stay here forever. And it's so. Do you think that you mentioned before that it's not the same to grasp in space than in on Earth? So do you think that grasping has to be for robots? Grasping for robots has to be attack in a different way, or doing grasping on space? What is your opinion? Oh, like how do you grasp things in space? So yeah, but so yeah like <laughs> if the, yeah. the the strategy to solve grasping in space has to be different than the strategy for grasping in in on on Earth, for example, to to grasp this here on Earth, there is a sequence uh, that if you apply, so you detect this, then you put the end effector here, a, a certain distance, and then you open the gripper, and then you approach, and then you close, and then you up, and then you are done, more or less. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, part of it, so some of it can can work just the same as it does in you know on the ground, but you have to be very accurate on where you're actually like applying your forces. Like I think you okay. have to be more accurate in space than you do on the ground. So like I said, like a lot of manipulation um, methodologies that we'll use uh, in labs are kind of in the, the flavor of like a push grasp kind of thing, where like you kind of want to push it a little bit, you know, maybe tip yeah. it a little bit and then like, and then grab and then, you know, yeah. like make a motion to grab the, the thing. Yeah. Uh, and that does not, that, that doesn't work as well in space. Cause as soon as you make contact, like you've imparted a force and that force might like make the thing like, you know, move away from you as opposed yeah. to like being. And so it's a, uh, it's like the strategies that you would use are things like um, being able to um, uh, envelop so like enveloping first and then imparting the force so that you like you more guarantee that that the that the item is going to like be in the the surrounded the surrounded by your, yeah by your, okay. By, okay by your manipulator yeah yes yeah, so, so in uh, in the I, I have also participated on the RoboCup competitions mm -hmm. but on yeah. the RoboCup at home the ones that is a robot that has to do things and it's everything a lot is about grasping stuff right. that you have to bring to somebody else and yeah we do this trick about so so you had uh, you, you mentioned you you had to be very precise in order to have the object between your your gripper because otherwise yeah. it's going is but that's very difficult that's very difficult unless your gripper is very, very wide or your object is very uh, thin and then you can ensure. But if the object is 
it's around there, then it's very likely that you are going to touch because of inconsistencies in the, just for example, in the calibration of the, of the I pen, all the, the transforms and the errors that you have there, then mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult. Oh. Yeah, it's a hard problem. Yeah, it's <laughs> so a hard yeah, I problem. Think, I think I think it's one of those things like people are able to like obviously astronauts are able to manipulate things in space without much of you know like without too much of an issue. And I think it's you know we're really good as people being able to adapt to you know different uh, you know circumstances. And so I think as a as we were you know getting more and more um, information of like what it's like to actually manipulate things in space for the robot, you know like different strategies just kept come up right so like okay. enveloping or like you know maybe you can push it against the the wall a little bit or whatever but i think that the important thing is that you have to like control where the forces go and like what they what the like if you were off by a little bit being able to be a little bit more um tolerant to of that yeah to recover. okay okay let me ask you one final question okay and and then we we finish um so what is your opinion about the future of robots in space? So, we, I mean, which task will be done by robots in the, in the close future? Let's say, let's say the, but something that they can do by themselves, by themselves. So what's your opinion? And if you can tell me about a date, that, that <laughs> okay, that's just <laughs> not required. Gonna, I don't know what date they're gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, obviously, like robots in, in space are really important. They can go places that, that, you know, it's harder to put a person in. So, like Mars is an example, right? We have the rover on Mars. Like the trip for to put a human on Mars is much more dangerous than it would be to just send a robot because, you know, the worst thing that happens if, if that mission doesn't turn out is that, you know, like some, some money is lost or whatever. But hopefully we get a lot of data back that it ends up being um, useful. Uh, so like all these like exploration things, you know, we send out, you know, our, so like our, our robot surrogates to, to go explore things. I think there are plans and in, in to like, you know, if you're going to set up a, a space station or you're going to set up like something on the moon or whatever that like uh, probably a, you're going to want a robot to do most of the initial setup a lot of the maintenance, like are people going to be constantly staffed or are they staffed there? Or are they going to like come and go? And so like a lot of the maintenance tasks, I think will end up being, um, you know, robotics kind of tasks. Uh, and then like, you know, the maintenance, more when you mention maintenance, which kind of maintenance do you mean? Because it, so in the experiment so far that you have uh, done, then you, you have seen how difficult it is to robot to do just a simple thing like, uh, let's say, uh, um, grabbing something from one place which is not the proper place, and it's 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 big. Let's say it's big. It's easy to grasp with both things, and then put it into another place in the correct place. That's very different difficult. So when you mention maintenance, in which sense will be something something close? Okay, I know in the future. That will be solved, okay? But in the let's say the next years, what can we expect it, based on your experience? Okay, I know that you are an, you you have a lot of experience that we don't <laughs> have, and that's why we want to know your opinion on, on this. Yeah, I think a lot of the challenge is doing like dexterous manipulation in space, and so like a uh, robot was a humanoid because you know the space station was launched before robots were really you know you know much of a much of a real product, and so like. Like the ISS was launched in like 1998, right? Like there wasn't that much there for to, to think about like, oh, a robot might be here, right? And so yeah. like everything that was launched and all of the tools and everything was very much like human centric. And so like, that's why it made sense to like put a humanoid robot in there. But if we're building something from scratch, you know, you don't have to have yeah. like, you don't have to have human dexterous manipulation in order to get things done, right? You can, you can say like, this is a special gripper that is like, you know, really accurate at, at, you know, doing this one task or like yes. this special robot that's really accurate at doing this this one um uh one thing and you can like custom design it to to do that as opposed to like being like here's a general robot that can like do everything that a human can do and so like i, can ma I imagine that that's probably more of the way that that it would you know the more near-term like <laughs> development of, of robots will in space will probably be like the rover does it, it probably can't support a human you know driver in it right but it does a really good job at, at what it's what it's designed to do um okay okay i i do agree on that with you yes yes yes, yes. I, I, so is the line of uh 
making robots more um, custom for the situation or for the tasks that they have to do instead of making general purpose robots that can adapt to our environment, to, to human environment. Yeah, I think I think at least for for the like if you were able to custom design a robot and you want if you wanted to do a specific thing for for a extended period of time, which I imagine it is true for for a lot of the space uh, robot tasks, that like having a, a more specific robot will be like the more the more the, near term like realistic yeah. thing to do. <laughs> yeah, let's exactly. L let me say more productive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this word. What can I say? Okay. <laughs> and final, final, real, final question: uh, Will those robots run Ross? <laughs> of course. <Yeah>, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was waiting for that. Yeah, very good. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison. It's been a pleasure to know about everything uh, on uh, that you know about uh, Ross in space. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice talking to you today. Okay, thank you very much. And now for the people out there, all the ROS developers listening to the podcast, thank you very much for listening. So this is the end of the episode. And remember to share this episode with your friends if you like it. If you don't like it, tell us why, because we want to improve and provide you the, the real ROS developers podcast that you like. So give us some feedback. And I will put a link to do that on the comments. And that's all for today. See you next week with a new lesson from the experts. And until then, keep pushing your Ross learning. Hey.